Okay. So I'm going to start uh, as usual with a reminder of where we are in the book. Um, I mean, pretty much the same as in the last lecture, but it's so good. It's a little aesthetic. As soon as you get to the aesthetic, now we're in the transcendental logic. And it has two parts transcendental analytic and transcendental dialectic. And the transcendental analytic has two parts. Analytical concepts and the analytical principles. And the analytical concepts are two parts. <laughs> the physical deductions are clues to the discovery of all pure concepts of the unseen. And the transcendental deduction. And although the transcendental deduction isn't uh, like broken down into two parts in the table of contents, I've been saying that it does really have two parts. Uh, and the you know, last time was reading for last time was the first part, reading for this time is the second. I notice every year when I when I actually read it, that maybe the way I divide it is that it's actually, I mean, the truth is there's like a couple of sections in between that are kind of a transition from the first part to the second part. That's the beginning of the first reading. I, that's probably not important, but. Um, so, um, so that's where, you're, where we are. And again, what I've claimed is that the metaphysical deduction, and I keep saying that this is what I've claimed because even on this level, no one agrees, <laughs> right? So um, it's, you know, if you think I'm gonna tell you for sure what Kant means in this book, you know, I could tell you one thing, but if you read it a different reader of Kant, they would tell you something else. <laughs> it's not easy to understand. But anyway, what I've claimed is that the metaphysical, what the metaphysical deduction says is that if there is any object of experience, we must be able to think of three categories. And the transcendental deduction is then supposed to show that there must be an object of experience. And therefore, conclusion, we can think of three categories. We can show that in the metaphysical deduction. Um, so, um, right, and I said, you know, you can, you can call what we're trying to show the existence of in the transcendental deduction, the transcendental object, that is, it's the object of cognition understood only in terms of the predicates of objects as such, which is what the categories are. Um, so, um, and that is what Kant calls it in the A edition. In the B edition, calls it nature in general. It basically means the same thing, right? The object of experience, but without adding anything in that uh, any particular experience in. Um, okay, so like we're trying to show that there is such a thing. Um, and uh, and I also said that uh, the, the division between these two parts seems to be that in the first part, he shows that without assuming anything in particular about what our form of sensible intuition is, right? So like, um, I'm gonna erase all this.
There's two kinds of intellect that could be. Intellect equals understanding. There's two kinds of understanding that could be. Now, I say could be, I mean such that there's no contradiction in thinking about it. One is an intuitive intellect, which is the same as an intellectual intuition. It's an active faculty, it would be an active faculty of representation. That is the principle that the object must, its object must conform to is the principle that's in it, in the subject of intellection. Um, and it relates, refers immediately to the good object. So it's both an intellect and intuitive, or it's both an intuition and intellect. We do the same thing, I think. Again, even that's controversial, but I think these two things mean the same thing. Okay. On the other hand, you can have our kind of intellect. I haven't discussed this term yet, and Khan doesn't use it very often, but when he does, this is what he's talking about. A discursive intellect is the kind we have. Discursive has something to do with the fact that it thinks in concepts. But why the word for that is discursive, I'm not sure I can explain. But in any case, so you know, this is the kind of intellect or understanding that we have. And this goes with an intuition which is not intellectual, but is sensible. Right? So the curse of intellect is the kind of intellect or understanding we have that uses general concepts to refer to objects. And uh, because general concepts are never sufficient to pick out a, a single actual object, a uh, discursive intellect like never refers immediately to its object. It always needs um, some other, some faculty by which the object can affect it and, and can determine the reference. But determine means. Determine can mean two things, and it seems like Kant uses it to mean both, which is confusing. But um, because, like, a terminus can mean like a uh, like a border. So, like, to determine something would be to like, you know, set limits to that. But a terminus can also be like an aim. Right, like some like like it's something you're aiming at. And in that sense, to determine something means like give it a direction or to determine it. So I think here when he says that the, the this intellect, intellect needs sensible intuition to determine an object, he means it's like here's the general concept. It's kind of like open to its object coming anywhere as many times as it, it happens right so like the, i mean to think of an empirical concept like dog you know it's just like anywhere there is a dog or dogs this concept can be applied but in order to actually be applied it has to be given a direction for some particular dog and that's not the same doesn't happen. You might think that happens by supplying more and more, and more specific concepts until only that dog is left, right? But the Kant says, no, that's not how we do it. You have to wait until the dog affects us, right? So, like, we see the dog, we feel the dog, we smell the dog, um, <laughs> and that gives direction to our concept. So, um, now, like, the way that actually works for us with respect to external objects is that we're talking literally talking about direction. Direction in space, right? But, and this is why I've gone into this whole discussion. In the first stage of the transcendental deduction, Kant isn't asking, uh, or Kant is like 
abstract based on the question, how exactly does this faculty of sensible intuition determine an object? How does it allow us to determine an object? In real life, the answer is space and time. But uh, so in the first part of the tangential deduction, he's just saying some way, right? So that is so what he's showing in the first part is supposed to apply to any determination. No matter what form it's in, what's the form of the sensible intuition? So you might want me to give you another example of a different form of sensible intuition you could have, right? But as I keep saying, we don't know that any other examples are possible. In what sense do we know that ours is a special case? We know it's a special case in the sense that we can't derive the form of space and time from just from the fact that we have a dispersive intellect. Or in other words, there's no contradiction in saying it could be some other. But we can't actually supply examples. People are not, I've said this a number of times now, but people are still not looking after the rest. Other questions about this? Because this actually is kind of central to the way I read Kant. No questions? Cool. All right. So anyway, right? So um, so this was all by way of explaining, right? So like in the first part of the transcendental deduction, he's just dealing with this in general. And he's showing that any discursive intellect must have an object. So, um, right, like any the metaphysical deduction also didn't pay any attention to the particular forms of our intuition. So, any discursive intellect will, will have the same categories. I mean, or anyway, we have to think of it as having the same categories as us. Like, we don't know how, you know, like this, this being this form of sensibility is. Is um, not space and time can't perceive this. <laughs> so, like, we don't, I mean, it, you know, Kant says even the laws of arithmetic are dependent on our form of intuition, right? So, we don't really understand how it would list the categories, how it would count them, you know, or what it would do instead of listing and counting. <laughs> But from our point of view, it has the same categories as us. Um, so, you know, showing that every discursive intellect has an object means showing that the categories must have an object, uh, whatever the form of sensible intuition. And then the second stage um, then plugs in our form of our sensible intuition. I mean, he mentions both space and time. Uh, Time certainly is played the more important role here, but like, it's not clear how important space is. At some point, it seems like space is also pretty important. Um, and like what I was saying last time about why do there have to be two parts? Because if you showed it for any discursive intellect, doesn't it automatically follow that it's true for us? Right, or in other words, you showed it for any form of sensible intuition. Doesn't it automatically follow that it's true for our form of sensible intuition? And um, I'll just say again what I said last time, which is that um, uh, the reason that's not true is because of what I was saying before that, like. We only know this one example is even possible. So as long as we don't fill this in, we're saying something about the relationship between certain concepts, discursive intellect, categories, sensible intuition, but we don't know if any of those concepts refer to any until we put in the one example that we know. We know this example is actual and therefore possible. <laughs> uh, and because of that, we know there can be such a thing as discursive intellect and sensible intuition. Um, so, um, um, 
Okay, so I think that's roughly speaking what's going on in the Kent Center production as a whole. Are they talking about work? So what I'm going to do is just last time, that is yesterday, I, I you know, cut off in the middle of trying to explain how the first part works. So I want to go back and try to explain that better, knowing full well that that probably means I'll won't get enough time to check out the second part, but you know, I don't know, that's why. So uh, all right, I'm gonna go I'm, unless there are other questions. Yeah. So could you quickly talk about the bits from the electrical demonstration and some transition? Yeah, so again, like intellectual in, intuition is Um, so remember again, the definition of intuition is a representation that refers immediately to its object. So, uh, that is, it doesn't need anything else in between to, in order to determine an object. So, um, and the definition of intellectual, an intellectual faculty of representation is that it acts. And again, what I keep saying is active here, like it doesn't mean, of course, that when I when I bring an object under my concept, I literally want to do something to it, right? But it means it's my concept to which the, I'm asking the object to conform, right? So, um, so if you put those two things together, an intellectual intuition means that it's both active and it refers immediately to, a, to an actual single object. Um, and Kant says, like, the only way we can think about that, we can't, this isn't really something we can prove because we can't even be sure we're thinking about anything with these concepts. But like the only way we can put those together is to imagine that this is a being which causes the existence of its object by representing. So like the only, like everything about what this object is, is what the intuitive intellect put into it. Um, and that's also why, well, I won't go through this again, but that, that's also, I, I tried to explain before why this object is a thing in itself, right? So, so that's what an intellectual intuition would be. So a sensible intuition, I mean, in a way, like, to, like, to understand what a discursive intellect or a sensible intuition is, like, I think maybe the best way to do it is to start with this and then say, but imagine a case where the intellectual part isn't enough and you need something else. Right. And that's our case. So the sensible intuition, so it's like in this case, the active faculty doesn't get all the way to the object, it only succeeds in representing the object as possible. Right, so like if I have the concept dog, I'm representing the dog as possible by just by picking the concept. But to um, refer to an actual object, there has to be something singular. The general concept doesn't pick that out, right? The general concept always applies to many possible cases. So, um, so, so. And then so so that kind of active faculty doesn't refer immediately to its object. Something else must come in between to determine a particular object. How can that work? Well, it's not active, so it must be passive, right? Meaning the principle uh, that meaning the object makes me conform to it. Right? That's why I said, I mean, even though Kant doesn't literally think this the way Leibniz does. It's it's almost as if in sensible intuition the object is representing me. <laughs> so um, it's making me conform to it, and uh, and that's what builds in that extra step that selects one actual object other than any possible one, the one that affected me. Does that does that help? All right. 
Um, and like again, at this level of abstraction, we don't know how that happens, right? All we know is that somehow the object is going to force me to conform to it, and in that way, my intellectual representation will get directed at a single object, right? But um, uh, we don't know that because we're abstract, because we're not paying attention. Kant discusses the attention, and I'm confused by what he says about that. But I think somehow it's not like attention, it's just Kant uh, suddenly paying attention to attention. <laughs> but in any case, um, yeah, so we're like we're forgetting what we, of course, know how. How it really directs us, namely, it, it, it directs us to an object that's affecting us from a certain direction at a certain time. Right? So, all the other possible dogs are not what I'm referring to right now with my concept because they're not here. Right? Or if they are here, I'm, you know, I'm not looking at them. Oh. Okay. Um, uh, so now I'm going to return. I don't know what the next, I mean, I was trying to go through this yesterday by writing each one of these steps up on the board. First of all, that's going to be hard because the printer uh, next to my office is, continues to be broken. So I'm going to have to go back and forth from the screen. But I'm not sure whether writing these long sentences on the board is the right way to go. And yet I do want to break it up into steps. I just, I guess I should have names for each step, maybe. <laughs> but I mean, I'll say so, like the first step is that um, See, I have to put I in the group here somehow. If I am a discursive intellect, I think, right? That is that, that I'm a discursive intellect implies that I think. So this is this is supposed to be analytic. In fact, all of these steps are supposed to be analytic. Um, Ray Kant says that even though the thing they're proving is the possibility of um, a priori synthetic judgments. The argument itself is analytic, and if you think about it, it has to be that way, right? Because if there, if we had to make synthetic a priori judgments in this argument, then we would have had to already prove that synthetic a priori judgments are possible, right? So, like this thing is all going to work by drawing consequences out of the very concept of discursive intellect. Now, I mean. That seems like getting something for nothing. I mean, it sounds like the ontological proof of the existence of God, where we start with the concept of God and then somehow we get these consequences for something that, that something actually exists. Again, I don't know if, if you're familiar with that. I, I think my impression is a lot of people took the empiricist course and not the rationalist course. Yeah, so I try to talk about the ontological proof. Um, but like, so I mean, well, we will, Kant will talk about the ontological proof later, so it will come up then. I'll just say now it's, you know, it's, well, in the form Kant is responding it to, it's, it's, it's Descartes' proof, although there are other versions before Descartes. Um, and it does, it, it is like a weird thing where you'd like to find God and then you prove from the definition that something meeting that definition must exist. So, I mean, you might think something like that is going on here because I just said all these things are analytics. These are all consequences of the definition. 
But so that's why I said last time you should pay careful attention to this first step. This is where something else comes in. But the other thing that comes in isn't like uh, axiom or, you know, um, um, a thing we can be certain a priori is true. The thing that comes in is that I'm listening to the argument. Right? Like the, the thing I'm allowed to, I'm allowed, if I'm making an argument to someone, I'm allowed to assume that they're kind, they're kind of being that can understand an argument. Because if they're not, then, uh, um, well, they can't object, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, so this is a way of introducing a like contingent truth that I exist and am a discursive intellect. Um, in such a way that like the person reading the argument, the, the like the meditator, so to speak, <laughs> um, is like forced to accept it. And that's why I also said yesterday that it's it works the same as Descartes' cogito argument, right? If like you're reading through the second meditation and it says, you know, um, I think, therefore, I exist. And you say to yourself, do I believe that conclusion of that argument? I don't know. I, I, I have some doubts about it. Descartes is going to say, well, if you have some doubts about it, you certainly exist, right? <laughs> so that's the same thing here, right? If you say, um, so it's like there's like a, so to speak, a hidden present premise, if I am a discursive this way, which I am. But this was, this part isn't proved, right? Nor is it a first principle, right? It's not something that's necessarily true. I might not have existed. It's just, uh, um, but it's it's something that uh, I can't argue with because arguing with something is is a function of a discursive intellect. Okay, so again, I think I said this all this in yesterday's lecture, and now I probably waste the time saying it again, but it's, it's, I mean, it's important because it's important to try to figure out where um, Like, where is it that the, the transition from merely talking about definitions to proving something? Like, where's where, where's that extra force come in? And this is where it comes from. Um, so, like, this, so to speak, is the, is the third thing, X, by which we're connecting. Um, all right, I'll, I, I guess I'll, I'll say more about that. Well, no, I probably won't. But anyway, so that's the first step. So the second step, which I've already been saying a lot about, is Thing equal to use concepts to represent objects using concepts. And a concept is this is something Latin sometimes adds in Latin, conceptus communis. Uh, I mean, the general word for concept is the grid, right? So it's uh, it's not just adding an us to be canceled, it's giving a Latin equivalent. But a concept is commune, 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 I don't say that. Meaning it's a, a concept is a common representation. 
It's a general representation. Someone asked yesterday, is this like Locke's abstract general ideas? And the answer is yes. That's what it's like. <laughs> hey, so it's, uh, well, I mean, that's what I just got finished explaining about the difference between a discursive intellect and an intellect and an intuitive intellect. A discursive intellect represents things by general uh, representations that could apply to many possible cases. So, so now, I mean, um, use the concept of, like a general representation means, um, represent the actual object as one among many possible. Again, this is this is analytic, but as I'm just drawing out the consequences of the definition of a general representation. If it's a general representation, that means that even like here's the concept God, and right now I'm using it to refer to this particular God that's affecting my senses. Um, anyway, this dog. Um, so, uh, Um, I'm using it to represent this as a dog, but what that means is that I'm using it to represent this as part as conforming to a rule to which, in principle, many possible things could be. Um, so, this, I think, is what Kant calls the analytic unity of apperception. This is a term he uses, uh, or a phrase he uses. Um, put down the Kant's fifth page. It's um oh it's a note to B one thirty three. The analytic unity of consciousness belongs to all con concepts as such. If, for instance, I think red in general, I thereby represent to myself a property which, as a characteristic, can be found in something, or can be combined with other representations. Uh, wait, where's the phrase analytic unity of perception there? Oh, analytic unity of apperception is in the text that that's the note on. The analytic unity of apperception is possible only the pre under the presupposition of a certain synthetic unity. So, so far, so the analytic unity of apperception means that um, uh, when I use this general representation, I'm thinking of it as the same representation that also could be used to refer to other possible ideas. So it's, um, so the unity here is like the unity of this concept that remains the same concept or could remain the same concept even if different objects were substituted. And our perception, um, basically means self-consciousness. So why is this a unity of apperception? Well, 
um, um, I think it's like because this is an active representation, it's my rule. So in using it, I'm conscious of the fact that I could use it for other objects. And that's a kind of um, representation of my own unity in the face of different possible sensations. Um, So this is kind of like what this is why Todd says sometimes says things like, you know, um, I'm conscious of my own activity. And that's why I call myself an instrument. Um, I'm conscious of my own activity, meaning that every time I represent something, I represent it conforming to my rule. So even though you know I'm not representing the dog as me, somehow in the representation of the dog is the fact that I'm, you know, a subject that could represent more than one thing. Um, so, uh, so anytime, so to use so to be an assertive intellect is to think that is to use general representation, that is to be conscious of myself as possibly having other objects. Um, um, This presupposes that um, I can be conscious of, of myself on different occasions as the same. Same on different occasions. Now, uh, I write it here. No, oh well. Um, so, um, um, now, I mean, like, again, if you add back in what we know about real life, what I mean by different occasions is different times. Right, that we're talking about identity through time. But we're not presupposing anything about the form of intuition here. So we don't know that these different occasions are different times. We just know, but we know that there's somehow different circumstances in which I would be the same me, because otherwise it wouldn't be possible for me to have this representation that I could also use for something else. Again, like putting back in what we know about time, we could say, like, it would, it's not possible to use the representation dog as a general representation that could apply to this dog or to something other dog without thinking myself as at some other time being the same subject and representing a different dog. Right? That's the only way that's possible. But again, forgetting about time, we don't know how we, where the, we don't know in like what kind of order these different occasions for applying the concept comes. But we just know there must be different ones, and I must be the same subject in all of them. Um, and this, I think, is what Todd calls the synthetic community of appetite. Because now, so now instead of focusing on this object, I'm representing the dog, 
but at the same time representing myself, or at the same time representing the dog in such a way that it could also be a different dog. Um, here, I'm actually turning around and representing myself as an object that has different properties, so possibly has different properties at different times. Um, use an analytic aesthetic here. I'm not sure I completely understand how it's related to analytic and synthetic judgments or analytic and synthetic method or like why this is analytic and this is synthetic. But I mean, I think you could, the synthetic here at least, if it weren't for the analytic, <laughs> I would just explain it this way. Synthetic unity. Synthetic unity is what the understanding or intellect contributes in general to representing an object. Um, right? The object affects the, the object affects me in a manifold way. First, I kind of collect them together in order to compare them to a single rule. And then the understanding supplies that single rule, which either applies or doesn't. So here, in, in this step, what I'm saying is, um, um, that In principle, the way I affect myself can be collected together in such a way as to show it as an instance of a single rule, represent it as an instance of a single rule. So, in other words, I'm saying for the concept of myself has to have an object, it has to have an object that. Um, have I have to be conscious of myself as um, the same in on other occasions besides this one as I am now. So given that I'm only conscious of myself sensibly, that is, as I affect myself, what that means is I'm affecting myself one way now. On some other occasion, I'll affect myself some other way. But I have to be able to um, take those two different self um, affections as instances of being affected by the same thing. Um, right, so like with a regular empirical concept, right, this is how, you know, um, if I have the concept gold, you know, so let's say one time I get this yellow sensation. From something out here, and another time I get this heavy sensation. So like to be able to represent something as gold, I have to be able to represent the thing that's yellow as the same as the thing that's heavy. Um, Right? Again, the concept is like a rule or principle to which a manifold way, manifold way of being affected can function can form. So in this case, this thing, you know, is following the rule by affecting me both by looking yellow and by feeling heavy. Um, if 
like my concept rule is objectively valid. If it's a good concept, if it actually refers to something, then um, I'll find that sometimes, at least, I'm affected in a manifold way that follows that rule. And so yellow goes along with happy, goes along with other characteristics of gold. Um, uh, I mean, in, in the case of an empirical concept like gold, how do I know that it is objectively valid, that there is something like that? Well, only because first I experienced these things together and came to associate them with each other. So I don't know a priori that gold is a good concept. I know from experience. In this case, Hans is saying, you know, here's the concept. Um, I think it's basically the name of the concept. The concept of myself as the subject of representation. Um, and um, um, so like Uh, I guess, yeah. So, like, at one time, you know, uh, the object that's determined by this concept is the one that is like affecting itself in a certain way. And another time, it's the one that's affecting itself in some other way. But there must be a rule that connects these um, that can uh, allow me to represent them as two states of the same thing. And that's the synthetic community of our perception. I don't feel like I haven't explained that very well. Are there questions about this? Maybe I'm making it sound like more complicated than it is. I mean, the point is, like, if you just go back to, to what you said here, it's that to have a general conception means, like, every time I represent an object, I'm representing it as, um, like, um, Let me read what Kant says again in that note. The analytic unity of consciousness belongs to all general concepts as such. If, for instance, I think red in general, I thereby represent to myself a property which, as a characteristic, can be found in something or can be combined with other representations. Right? So when I, like, when I use the concept red to represent something, I'm representing it as, like, this is the red thing here, but red is something that could apply in other cases as well. And in order to do that, I must think of myself as being the same thing in those two different cases. What do you mean by that? <laughs> um, like as a point of reference when considering certain concepts, you have to acknowledge that you are the same. Well, it's maybe I don't understand this as well. No, I mean, I know I don't understand this as well as I should, but <laughs> um, uh, but. So, like at this stage, it's just that, yeah, I have as like as a kind of empty point of reference, I have to be able to think of myself as the same subject that could also have another, right? But, but um, I guess the question is, what am I thinking can do that? I must be thinking of something that could do that, and Kant says. 
So remember, we can only think of something, some particular thing, because it affects us. Right? Like a general representation, like thinking thing is not going to be sufficient. Thinking thing by itself is like a principle to which something might be. But by itself, it doesn't refer to anything actually. Right? So what we're trying to, what we're filling in here is, so how can I, I must be able to use, I guess you could put it this way, I must be able to use the representation thinking thing to refer to, to something that could be the same on this occasion and on other occasions. But how can I actually do that? And the answer, Kant says is, well, only if um, the way I'm affected by myself is um, um, the manifold way I'm affected by myself is uh, can serve to determine some concept. So it's like, I mean, I guess you could put it this way, that, you know, here it's the general concept of thinking thing, but the point is that the general concept of thinking thing is only going to be usable if it can be built into an empirical concept. Maybe that's the step I'm leaving out. Okay? So there has to be an empirical concept of myself, and then that has to be determined to something in particular by an actual like manifold of sensation, inner sensation. So um, like again, like the general concept thinking thing doesn't refer to anything. And I and I can't even just you say, well, okay, supply a sensation that conforms to it. And then you can, but it doesn't like it doesn't require any particular sensation. The general concept thinking thing, right? So you know, um, so I must be able to form an empirical concept of what is the thinking thing in, in question here in particular. That's going to be the empirical concept of myself. Um, and. Uh, so, like, I have to be able to do that. That means that um, like, in other words, in order to form the empirical concept dog, dog has, dogs had to be a certain way. <laughs> okay, like, now, I mean, of course, as far as the particular of dog, of the concept dog go, it has to do with the particular way dogs have to be. But as far as the transcendental components of the concept dog, dog, which is the category, dogs just had to conform to the categories, right? So, like, in order to form the concept dog, um, at least dogs had to have quantity and quality and relation, right? They had to be causes and effects, substance and accidents, right? That is, the categories had to be used to, usable to think. Now, I mean, uh, and remember, the whole problem in the transcendental deduction is. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any guarantee that the objects that affect us will cooperate. Right? It doesn't like why should the dog have to affect me in such a way that I can use the categories to think? Um, so, in the case of dogs, the answer is well, uh, there is no reason, but we just find by experience that they do. Thankfully, and that's why we're able to form and this empirical concept, right? But in this case, Kant is trying to say that um, just the fact that we exist as discursive intellects, as thinking things, means that something must have already cooperated, namely me, right? That is, I must have. Um, uh, affected myself in such a way that I can think myself as an object. 
So what does that mean? And this is what I was going to write down as the final step, but maybe it's not worth writing it separately. So just as in the case of God, what that means is that at a minimum, I must have affected myself in such a way that I can think of myself as having quantity and quality and so forth. Why was that guaranteed to happen? Why did that have to happen? What made that happen? We actually, I think, consciously can't answer any of those questions. All we know is that it did happen because here we are thinking. <laughs> um, right? So since, you know, if I am in a sense of intellect, which I am, <laughs> right? So since we find ourselves here thinking, this is what Kant sometimes calls the fact of reason. Since I find myself here thinking, um, I know that at least one object must have cooperated and affected me in the right way. Namely, the object of inner sense, what I, my empirical self. And that means the categories must be usable for thinking, right? It means um, it must be like it must be possible. I mean, um, like it doesn't mean that I that I actually always have an adequate empirical concept of myself, but just in thinking that I have a general representation that we could apply in other cases, I'm thinking that it's. There is one that would work, right? Like there is something I'm thinking about that I call myself that co would cooperate enough for some empirical concept to apply to. And that's enough to show that the categories apply to. Because the categories, again, are like the, the possibility that the parts of the capability of forming empirical concepts. Does, does that help at all? Everything I just said, yeah, okay. Um, I mean, you know, this this argument is notoriously difficult to understand, and Kant says it himself, right? So, like, and these steps, like these steps I've written here, don't correspond neatly to some part of the text, right? This is so, like, and actually step back quite a bit from the text to try to reconstruct what the thought is. Um, uh, I think if you look back to the text with this in mind, you'll see Kant saying, sometimes saying things that sound like pieces of this, but many times sometimes saying things that don't seem to fit in. And, you know, uh, as far as I know, every interpretation has that problem. <laughs> okay. but, um, but this at least makes sense to me. And I, I think it's consistent with most of what Kant says in, in most places anyway. Um, and then, you know, then it's not that you can just throw up your hands about the other places. Eventually, you have to try to figure out what he's saying, I guess. Unless, I mean, there is, right, I guess I probably should have said this at the beginning. There's one approach to interpreting this book is called the patchwork theory that says that Kant wrote different parts of the book at different times, and it's just not consistent with the stuff. <laughs> If that's true, then we're probably wasting our time reading it, right? I mean, like, you know, uh, so I'm going to assume that's not true. <laughs> but um, so if it's not true, then I guess you could still say he expressed himself badly in some places or something, but you can't use that excuse very often. Well, your interpretation is, is bad. <laughs> so, um, Okay. Yes. I mean, I was going to say something about judgment here and why why the forms of or why judgment comes back in. Um, I mean, like, we kind of expect judgment to be in here somewhere because remember the metaphysical deduction was supposed to work by showing like um, that just these must be the categories because 
Um, these are the characteristics empirical concepts have to have to be useful in justice. So from that point of view, it's not surprising that towards the end of the first part, he starts talking about judgment again. Um, yeah, section 19. The logical form of all judgments consists in the objective unity of the apperception of the concepts which they contain. Um, um, Yeah, I'm not sure if anything really is to say about that section. No, maybe I should go on. I mean, when he's, so what he says here is that like a judgment is not just two concepts put together, but two concepts put together as necessarily related in the object. Um, And although I understand why that's true and relevant, what I'm less sure of is why you can't say the same thing just about a concept to begin with, right? It's like the concept of, you know, so, um, I mean, uh, This is something you might remember from 100C, right? The, the law says that a representation of substances is, um, or an idea of substances is uh, an idea of necessary coexistence. That, um, right, that we're taking it that there's something in the object such that when we're affected one way, we're also affected another way. Um, so, I mean, it's true if you think, you know, like all cinnabar is red. So you're thinking that, you know, Right, so suppose red isn't part of the definition of cinnabar, so this is a synthetic judgment. You're thinking all cinnabar is red. So you, um, you're thinking uh, that on a condition that a manifold of sensation matches up with cinnabar, conforms to the rule of the concept cinnabar. On that condition, I can think it through using this other concept, red. But I don't see the conditions of that in the concept cinnabar itself, right? Like that is, it doesn't follow from the definition of cinnabar. So what am I claiming it follows? Well, I'm claiming it follows from cinnabar, right? That actual stuff. Um, I'm claiming that this is what makes it true that these two concepts go together, even though they don't go together by definition. Um, you know, and um, um, so. 
So, like, uh, um, How do I know that in the case of empirical judgment like this? I know it from experience. So, I mean, and therefore, I don't know with absolute certainty and universality. Okay? I could need an exception somewhere. Um, but, uh, but, like, just even the fact that I can collect evidence for it at all is because I assume that um, there's some way. That like the different ways I'm affected by things necessarily go together. Um, and then when I find that they really are going together, I say, well, maybe that's it. And I form an empirical concept. Um, and then, second of all, once I have the empirical concept, I could do the same thing to connect it to other concepts. So like, well, I guess the thing is like the synthetic, the synthetic a posteriori judgment depends on experience as the third thing that connects the two together, connects cinnabar and redness, right? They're not connected by definition, they're connected by experience, and experience can serve as evidence of, of um, a necessary connection. Um, only if we know that it's possible to form some empirical concept, and then we're just hoping this is the right one. We're trying them out, so to speak. Um, so, 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 put us all together. You can say, well, it's like it's only because of the, um, or that, like the conclusion of this is one way to put it is. It's possible to form empirical judgment. Right? Because this means it's possible to use the categories somehow to think my experience. And if it's possible to use the categories somehow to think my experience, then it's possible to form at least one of these valid empirical concepts. And if it's possible to think it's form at least one valid empirical concept, then it's possible to use experience of, as a third thing that I can use as a base set of judgment. Um, but like again the thing I don't understand about that is why not just this is connected to something I don't understand about the metaphysical deduction also. Like why take this deeper through judgment when you could just go straight to the concept and say like uh, Okay, let me say that again the right way. I think we could say the conclusion of this is that it's possible to make empirical judgments. If the conclusion of this is that it's possible to make empirical judgments, well, then in order to make empirical judgments, then I have to have empirical concepts to behave the right way. In order to have empirical concepts to behave the right way, I have to be able to use the categories to think experience. So if the uh, if the conclusion of this were I can make synthetic judgments, that is empirical judgments, that I got posteriori judgments, then you can get from that to I can form empirical concepts, and from that to the categories are objectively valid. They represent something. But so um, but the question is, why bring judgment? Why not just say, which is the way I presented it, kind of, right? I said, I have to have a concept that refers to myself. So I have one empirical concept, right? I didn't mention judgments. If I'd started with judgment, I could get the concept. You can't have a judgment unless you have a good concept to be the subject of the judgment. But I just said, look, I have to have a concept. And if I have a concept, then I have to be able to use the title. So, I mean, like I said, I'm not sure why this exception is going to take the deeper of these judgments here. 
It's a, it must be important. You can ask the same question about the metaphysical deduction. Like, why, if, if the categories are really what's needed to represent an object, why can't you start with the categories and get the table of judgments from that? Why do you have, why is the, the form, why are the forms of judgment more obvious than the categories? I'm not sure I can answer that about the metaphysical question. Also, there's not that I can answer answer what judgments we do here. That was probably a long thing about something you weren't worried about at all. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm worried about. All right. Uh, um, okay, that's everything I want to say to catch up on the first part of the of the transcendental deduction. Are there, are there questions about that? There's at least one really good question before, although I drew a really long answer. <laughs> Any questions in Zoom land? I don't think I have the chat box. No, but there's no post box in there. Okay. So in that case, I'm going to go on to say what I can about the second part. Now, like, I don't think I understand the second part as well. I think I understand the first part, which is probably bad news if you just notice that I don't understand the first part that well, but <laughs> I feel there are some things I can say about it. So um, so I said that the second part of the transcendental deduction has something to do with showing that our particular form of sensible intuition, space and time, um is um, or I guess you, you would say the way Kant says it himself. This is the title of section twenty six. Or no, it's actually it's the like the first few sentences of section twenty six. In the metaphysical deduction, the a priori origin of the categories has been proved through their complete agreement with the general logical functions of thought. In the transcendental deduction, evidently meaning the first part of the transcendental deduction. Well, I mean, you can tell because he, he actually cites the section numbers. In the transcendental, in transcendental deduction, we have shown their possibility as a priori no, modes of knowledge of objects of an intuition in general. I think he means of a sensible intuition in general, right? So, so the metaphysical deduction, we showed that the categories were the right concepts, basically. In the transcendental deduction, we have shown their possibility as a priori modes of knowledge of objects of a sensible intuition in general. Right? Again, that's how I talked about the first part, right? We're not saying what form of sensible intuition, it's just some sensible intuition. And then he says, see sections 20 and 21. And then he says, we have now to explain the possibility of knowing a priori by means of categories, whatever objects may present themselves to our senses. Right, so what's the difference between objects of an intuition in general and whatever objects may present themselves to our senses? The difference is that the objects that they present themselves to our senses have to come in the form of our intuition, space and time. Um, and I think, you know, that goes together with what he said in section 21 at the other end of this. Um, In the above, in the above proposition, a beginning is made of a deduction of the pure concepts of understanding. And in this deduction, since the categories have their source in the understanding alone, independently of sensibility, and must abstract from the mode in which the manifold for an empirical intuition is given. In what follows, see section 26, it will be shown from the mode in which the empirical intuition is given in sensibility that its unity is no other than that which the category prescribes, right? So in the first part, he abstracted from the mode in which 
object for given insensibility, namely space and time. And in the second part, he shows that this applies to objects given in space and time. So, you know, like if that's what's going on here, um, it's maybe a little surprising that there isn't much about the specific characteristics of space and time in the second part of the deduction. Um, we'll see coming up in the upcoming section, the analytical principles, there's going to be a lot of talking about the specific features of time, especially. And then, well, towards the end of the analytic principles, in the amphiboly, there'll be something about the specific features of space. But, um, right, so that, for example, the time is successive, the, you know, things like that. Um, but in the deduction, we don't yet get a lot of that, except in certain examples, right? The example he keeps coming back to. Um, um, drawing a line or applying the concept line to something, the geometrical concept line. Um, so then he talks about succession and uh, um, um, I guess he doesn't really mention this like direction, for example, as a property of space. Uh, he just talks about succession. But like in the new, that's kind of an example of the main argument that at first sight there isn't that much about space and time. But I think so. This is one thing I feel like I can say about the second part. Um, the faculty of imagination, which got mentioned a little bit before in the metaphysical deduction, but there wasn't much of it, suddenly pops up and is very important in the second part of the deduction wasn't mentioned in the first. So what is the faculty of imagination? I mean, I think these are things that I've said before, but um, uh, maybe saying them again will help. So um, in the right context. So on B151, there's what looks like a definition of the faculty of imagination. It's page 165 in Kemp Smith. Imagination is the faculty of representing an intuition, an object. So Kemp Smith translates an object that is not itself present. What Kant literally says here is even without its presence. Right, so imagination And the word that he uses for presence here is Gegenwart. So, like, this is also the word that, that means present as opposed to past or future. Um, yeah, so, uh, um, I mean, there's other words that could be translated as present in German that, that don't have to do with time. Um, that just mean like being at something or something like that, right? But this, this means presence in the sense of being present in the present, right? So I think here it's translated as, you know, even. When not present or um, non-present object, meaning in the sense that it's an object that's past or future. Um,
I mean, um, so in other words, I think what's going on here is the very fact of the imagination is um, is defined with reference to our form of intuition. We talk about another discursive intellect, one whose form of intuition is different from ours, then uh, we don't know what kind of faculty it, it, uh, which is responsible for synthesis. Because we, we don't know how it would be manifoldly affected. Right? Like, um, It's so hard to talk about this because the, the whole point of it is you're not supposed to be able to imagine, <laughs> right? Like you, you can't imagine another form of sensibility. Imagination is like presupposes our form. Of um, so at the same time, this definition of imagination is like, um, matches the way like Kant's early modern predecessors and I guess also the way Aristotelians talk about imagination or fantasia, right? That it's, you know, so like they usually think of it and it should be described in 100 C, we see it in 100 B, you probably would see it in 100 A also, that like imagination is taken to be like something like the ability to see or otherwise sense things, even though they're not there. Um, so, you know, but of course people always add, but you can't just make them up out of nothing, right? You have to have seen something like that before in order to be able to imagine it. Or at least you have to have been able to see the simple part that's made up of it, right? So like if Descartes says, um, at one point in the first meditation, the meditator is like, well, you know, even if a painter made up an object that was uh, so new that nothing like it had ever been seen, they would still have to use real colors. <laughs> right? They couldn't use colors that they've never seen. So, right. So, like, um, so I think that way of thinking about imagination, uh, you know, also involves this implicit reference to time. It's like imagination is the faculty of like bringing up uh, things that you sense, sensations that you had in the past again, even though the object that caused them isn't still there. Um, so, I mean, uh, as far as that goes, it so far it doesn't sound like it's necessarily that important. Like it sounds like it's kind of a faculty of like hallucinating, right? Like just having random sensations come back, even though the thing that caused them isn't there. So I think like uh, there's there's something else that Kant understands in this definition that isn't explicit, but it's something like to like appropriately represented object in the intuition even without its presence. So like, what do I mean by that? Well, it's like, um, um, in empirical cases, this, is, this has to do with association. I'm having a present sensation. The imagination doesn't just call up random other sensations put together with it, that I've seen had in the past. It calls up sensations that I've had together with this one. So like um, the way Kant understands that is that the imagination is um, trying to put together sensations in such a way that they can be compared to a concept. 
either an existing concept. So then the imagination is like producing an image of an existing empirical concept. Right. right? So like, you know, to see a dog now, of course, I don't see every part of the dog. I don't see the back, you know, side of the dog. I don't see the inside of the dog. Um, but uh, but I see part of the dog, and you know, I don't feel the weight of the dog, and you know, maybe hopefully I don't smell the dog. <laughs> um, so like, uh, um, and yet, like to be an object of the concept dog, it has to have all those things. Like a dog, you know, the inside of a dog, be heavy like a dog, right? So there's missing some of those things. It's not a dog, it might be a cold dog, right? So, like, so I get some sensations that can form to my concept, and then, like, the imagination is going to supply the honor by association. And that allows me, I mean, of course, sometimes I can go, I can make mistakes. I think it's a dog, but it's really not. <laughs> but in the good place, that's what allows me to succeed in representing something as a dog. Um, so, but on the other hand, if I'm looking at something that, that like, I don't yet have a concept of, or at least I only have a general concept of it, but I don't have a specific concept of it, yet, right? So I, like, I'm seeing this, and let's say I already have the concept of animal, but I don't have the concept of dog. So I see it's an animal, you know, but, but now the imagination is supplying associations in order to help me form a new experience. And it's basically the same thing, but it's just like different stages in the same process, right? So again, it's going to like, if I've seen an animal that kind of looks like this before, then the imagination is going to supply by association some of the other characteristics. And if, like, if that works often enough, I'm going to I'm, I start forming a empirical concept. And then once I have the empirical concept, the imagination will do the same thing, so to speak, to help me apply it. So that's what the empirical imagination does. Um, um, So, um, so what is what is the a priori or transcendental imagination? Um, but that's what Todd talks about in section twenty six. So I think I mean as usual, I think a priori faculties are not like again there isn't a time a priori. Like when I, you know, when I think about a priori objects using a priori concepts and right, like all our knowledge begins with experience. So all these like a priori faculties doing their a priori stuff are all abstraction from the empirical faculties doing the empirical stuff. Right. So like when I talk about the a priori or transcendental employment of the imagination, I think. What it means is that um, um, just as we went the categories of a priori concepts were the basic capabilities I needed in order to form an empirical concept, the like a priori act of the imagination or transcendental act of the imagination is like the basic capability I must have in order to be able to use the imagination for those empirical purposes. So, um, so, 
So it means that um, um, it's like the things that imagination does to supply by association the object of any empirical time as such. And that, like, not surprisingly, turns out to be um, the thing that the imagination has to do to supply something as object of the categories. Right? Because the categories are like what's common to every empirical concept, because they're the basic, like, uh, capability to have any empirical concept. So, like, what the imagination has to be able to do fundamentally is um, collect the manifold ways that I'm affected in such a way that I can use those basic capabilities to form an empirical concept. So, what we can say about it in general or like in the case of an object in general or a transcendental object in nature in general, all we can say about it is, well, you know, we don't know what particular sensations they're gonna be. We only know that from experience, let alone how they're gonna be associated with each other. We certainly only know that from experience, but we know that like somehow um, um, there's, there, there has to be a way of putting them together such that a concept formed using the categories can be compared to. So, like, but that's, you know, it talks about this distinction between the intellectual synthesis. And the synthesis of the imagination. And he says, you know, they're both a priori, but this one is completely removed from sense, whereas this one has something to do with the form of our sensibility. So, you know, what what is it's like a metaphorical way of saying that something that's really complicated to say literally. <laughs> right? Like, you know, just like when I was just trying to say what it means that the imagination a priori is able to synthesize the pure manifold of sense. That's the way you can describe this. So like to say what that means, literally, you have to translate that all into stuff about general capabilities of doing something in general. <laughs> Right? So it's much easier to talk about it as if it's something that happens at some mysterious time a priori, that we have the pure manifold of sense and the pure imagination somehow puts it together as the object of a pure concept. Um, um, so, when, like when he, so when he says there's two different syntheses, there's the synthesis of the understanding and that is the intellectual synthesis. I think if you pay attention to how he goes back and forth between intellectual and understanding in these sections, you'll see how right it is that intellect and understanding are equivalent. So, yeah, so that this is the intellectual synthesis of the pure understanding. What what this is is basically what we prove has to be possible in the first part of the production. Somehow we have to be able to form an empirical concept. Meaning, somehow we have to be able to use the categories. Um, but in order for that to work, that means somehow we have to be able to collect the actual kind of manifold we have in such a way that uh, it can be compared to some empirical concept. And that, like, we must be able to is then metaphorically translated into 
the pure imagination did that already a priori. Um, okay, obviously, uh, I haven't got much of the detail of this, but I want to talk about what's going on in Girls Out Loud. Um, but I guess, so I'll just say one more thing about this that might explain some of the ways to us. So, you know, so she says that this synthesis of the imagination is an effect of the understanding on the sensibility. Right, it's like something that the understanding did to the sensibility. Now, again, obviously that's a metaphor. This isn't something that happened at some particular time. It has to already be in place when we're having experience. And if we don't have any knowledge before it's been. So it's, you know, but, um, but I think what it means is, and if you go back to the text, I hope you can see what she's saying is that, um, like, how do I know myself as, a, as an intellect, as an active being? Um, a being capable of active representation. Um, not immediately, that would be an intellectual intuition of myself. I don't have that. How do I know? And I think the answer is, I know it because I see the imagination collecting things in the right way for me to apply consciousness. So like, and, and that sort of speaks to you, I see the effect of my active faculty on the way sensations are presented. Um, so like, but I'm drawing that line. I don't see the, the part of me that's, a, that, that's applying the concept line, right? I, don't, I can't turn around and watch myself proposing that rule. But what I see is the parts of the line being presented one after another while like, still remembering the other parts, right? And, and expecting the, the ones that are coming um, in accordance with the rule. And it's like, so um, this is my experience of myself as the same intellect through, throughout different sensations. And this, remember, is exactly what we showed. That's exactly what we showed there had to be at the end of the first part of the dress. Okay, I see people looking in here, I think, for the next class. So, and I've gone like three minutes over. So, I hope that made some kind of sense. Uh, and I will see you next week. From now on, we're on the regular schedule. Thanks, Evans. Thank you. You too. Bye.